Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I wish I could have been here yesterday. I heard there were some fabulous talks, but as I think I've told a few of you, I actually have to earn a living by being a teacher, too. So that's what I was doing yesterday. Well, I, I want to provide a, a broad perspective for where we're going uh, in, in these issues and point out that, uh, that to address the kinds of problems that, that we know we are facing is going to require uh, a much more synthetic approach than we have tended to take in the past. Now, where we're going on one level, on a global basis, we're heading toward about 35% more people, uh, leveling our population, leveling off at about nine, nine and a half billion, something like that. Uh, what's more important in terms of some of the future forces on the environment is that per capita incomes around the world are growing, and they're growing especially rapidly in the poor nations of the world, which means the buying power of those uh, people is going up, and that's expected on a global average to be 140% bigger by the year 2050. So the buying power is going up quite rapidly. And so what I want to talk about is uh, some of the forces that come from this, uh, from this increased population, increased demand, what that does and how it really even uh, more greatly strengthens sort of the, the land, uh, uh, coastal ecosystem linkage, uh, and the, uh, the interplay of food and energy and, and demands and so on on the environment as well as then talking about some solutions to some of the problems that are likely to arise. So here, here's why I mentioned uh, per capita income. This is a graph showing per capita greenhouse gas emissions, or you can look at it as a graph showing per capita use of fossil fuels uh, versus income. Each point is uh, uh, an economic group, a UN economic group, uh, for a given year from 1950 something to, 19, to 2006. What you'll see is that uh, per capita use of fossil fuel uh, goes up very, very quickly as income goes up. And incomes are going up around the world right now. And the same kind of relationship, but not on that log scale, uh, links per capita demand for food. This shows kilocalories of crop uh, produced uh, per citizen per day uh, in various nations. Uh, and this is dividing the, all of the nations, the 100 largest nations of the world, into groups of 15, from A being the 15 richest nations down to G being the 15 poorest in, uh, in that group. And what you'll notice is that the number of crop kilocalories, uh, these are for edible crops, these are the 275 most common edible crops that are followed by the UN FAO. Uh, the very poorest uh, nations have, oh, two and a half or 3,000 uh, kilocalories grown per person per day. They don't eat it all. There's waste and other things which go on. Uh, and the richest nations have eight to eight and a half thousand kilocalories per person per day. And this dependence upon income represents shifts in diets as people get richer. We've looked nation by nation at, at, at various components of diet and how they shift in response to income. And there is uh, a remarkably consistent trend across the world in, in uh, people and their preference, maybe going back to our Neolithic roots, I'm not sure. Uh, but as people become wealthier, they definitely like to eat more meat. Uh, and uh, since we uh, drove mammoth elephants, uh, giant ground sloths, and many things else extinct 10,000 years by overeating them then, uh, we are now uh, using, uh, we're using livestock animals uh, as well as seafood to meet a lot of this demand uh, for, uh, for meat. And, that, and because of the efficiencies or inefficiencies of different livestock animals, about three-fourths of the calories that are grown in the uh, richest nations are actually uh, come to human consumers via the livestock which eat them for meat, eggs, uh, uh, milk, etc. So that's sort of where uh, we're going. Uh, that's sort of what the forces are. And if you look at this and ask how much more food are we going to need when the world's population levels off at the income levels of 50 years from now or by the year 2050, it's between 100 and 110 percent more food and with a slight bias toward uh, increasing the demand for protein in crops, increasing more rapidly. That's mainly from soybeans being fed as a livestock feed, uh, as a high-protein livestock feed. So now let's think about what's going on here, because I know right now you're thinking, where are the coastal ecosystems? What are we, why am I talking about this? But uh, if you look at energy use, uh, energy is one of our major sources, fossil fuel use, uh, greenhouse gases. We already heard talks uh, uh, today and yesterday that point out the strong effect of, of uh, uh, change in global climate on coastal and, and, uh, and marine ecosystems. Uh, food demand is met by using nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizer, pesticides, and so on, which don't just miraculously disappear, as we know, but they end up going as non-point sources into uh, coastal waterways. 
And coastal waterways are major sources of fisheries, as we know, as are some open ocean. Uh, and that is already, I knew, uh, I actually, I wish I could change this after I heard uh, Steve's talk. Because I thought the whole world was a 50%, but apparently it's just the US is about a 50% for that. But so of, in global fisheries, a lot of our seafood comes from wild caught fish, but uh, the proportion coming from um, aquaculture is rising. So here's something that, that most of us don't really appreciate about agriculture. In making the food that we need for people right now, agriculture releases 32% of all the uh, greenhouse gases released every year globally. And transport is uh, what? 14%. Now, you see different numbers if you only see carbon dioxide, but carbon dioxide is only one of the three major greenhouse gases. When you look at all three major greenhouse gases, what we eat is more than twice as important for future greenhouse gas impact than what we drive. Um, so that is uh, one of the concerns I have. Uh, now, let's look at, at how we're going to need to double food in the next 50 or so years. We doubled it uh, in the last 40 or so years during the Green Revolution. And here's what happened to inputs to crops. The, the upper blue the line with the bl uh, blue dots is nitrogen fertilizer. It went up 600% to double global food production. Uh, we had 200% more phosphorus, uh, the, the red dots, uh, to double global food supply. And we used 80% more water in irrigation to double global food supply over that period. It wasn't that we had some miraculous new genotypes in the Green Revolution that gave us more food. We found genotypes that gave us more food when we gave them nitrogen, uh, irrigation, uh, and, uh, and so on, and phosphorus. Now, those nutrients, as we know, and we already saw some beautiful, much more informative pictures in mine, affect the uh, nearshore marine ecosystems. Here is seagrass in an area which, which has very low loading of nitrogen uh, from land sources, from rivers. Here it is with high loading. And though the things you're seeing that make the water all cloudy are algae that are, are blocking out light and really inhibiting the growth of the, of the seagrass. So that's sort of uh, one sort of in indication of that. Now, not only in, in did we increase inputs of N and P, we also have greatly increased inputs of various pesticides in agriculture to double global food production. And because we used almost none of them before the Green Revolution, we now use very high quantities. They went up, I think the, our number here was 950% from the paper we had in Nature in 2002 on this issue. And finally, land. Uh, now, land clearing has lots of impacts. Uh, land clearing itself clearly gets rid of habitat where terrestrial plants and animals lived and, and caused the loss of biological diversity. But land clearing also increases, even without any added nutrients, it increases nitrogen and phosphorus loading. As organic matter is broken down in the soil, without the uh, perennial plants taking it up, a lot of that is leached into the groundwater. There's surface flow of sediment in the groundwater and of nutrients. So land clearing itself uh, increases uh, loading to freshwater and marine ecosystems. And land clearing releases massive amounts of greenhouse gas. It's about a third of the total greenhouse gas emission from agriculture comes from land clearing. And so to double global food in the past uh, required uh, about, oh, what, a half a billion or so hectares of land being cleared, which had these kinds of impacts. So we've done a lot of analyses have come out in a variety of different papers asking what might happen to these variables uh, should uh, we continue on the shifts in diet with income and continue on methods of agricultural, uh, increased uh, agricultural harvesting. Uh, and here are some of the things. We, with nitrogen fertilizer, we think uh, by 2050, will be up 185%, which is a huge increase from the numbers we have right now. Phosphorus, 140%. Pesticide use, 170%. And we think we're going to need about 800 million hectares of land to be cleared around the world to help uh, grow the food that is being demanded. So these, again, are massive increase, increases in inputs that can have big effects on, on um, oh my word, look at that. <laughs> yeah, it's, there are bars that aren't there. And you can't even, it was even a legend that isn't there. Um, you can see it in that PNAS paper, it showed up there. Uh, but so we also asked what this would imply for greenhouse gases. I remember mentioned right now agriculture is, uh, is about a third of global greenhouse gases. They also are projected to go up 185% uh, between now and 2050 to meet this uh, increased food demand uh, from land clearing, from nitrogen fertilizer and nitrous oxide and so on. And so uh, 
That makes, if this happened, the greenhouse gas release in 2050 from agriculture alone would be equal to almost the total greenhouse gas from all sources right now. So that's sort of the, the problems. Um, and to a great extent, what crops we grow on land um, and how those crops are grown have a huge influence on what happens to the coastal waterways and nearshore marine uh, ecosystems and the services they might be able to provide to society. And the point I want to make is the big variable in this is maybe we already know, I don't want to say the obvious, is that meat is a major multiplier of these effects because of how much grain it takes to produce uh, a kilogram of different kinds of, of livestock meat. This is a painting that's in a museum in Minneapolis that's a, about the size of this wall of chickens and chicken coops. And I just sort of, I just love it, what it says. But if you think about livestock production, there are clearly many issues, disease, uh, manure and its proper use, the efficiency of them, grain use, and so on. I want to just look at a few numbers here. So this shows for um, uh, confined animal feeding operation, cattle, pigs, poultry, for fish aquaculture, um, and for milk. And that 8.0 on my slide was over here. In case you're looking under fish aquaculture, it moved a little bit. Um, there are really massive differences in how much grain it takes to get a kilogram of edible uh, of meat, or how much protein, plant protein, it takes to give you a kilogram of meat protein. And for cattle, it's 20 kilograms of plant protein to give you one kilogram of edible beef protein. Uh, the best thing on the list as far as, as, as um, sort of meat things is fish aquaculture. The numbers for fish aquaculture clearly depend on what you're growing, but they're around 3 to 4. 3.3 is, is a mean of the ones I found. So much more efficient at turning uh, grains, if you will, into fish but only for cases where they're eating grain and not eating other fish. Uh, I, I would have to warn or, 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 or remind you. But poultry is clearly much better than beef and so on. So you can take these numbers and play lots of games for the slides I just showed you. And I'm not going to go through all these with you, but I think you can, you can easily envision what I'm getting at. You can ask, uh, what would happen to the nitrogen, the phosphorus um, impacts of a diet if the diets, if the uh, amount of beef in the diet in the nation were to fall by 10% or 20% or 50%? or if the beef were to be replaced by aquaculture fish, or even better if we had it, which we probably won't, wild cost fish, or poultry for, for pork and so on. Any of those substitutions really change um, these ratios here. I'm, I'm glad you had that problem, not me. That, always, things, that, that kind of thing always happens, to, but it's my computer, um, or my schedule pops up. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, I lead a pretty calm life. It was almost never that embarrassing, um, unlike some generals. <laughs> um, so, but anyway, if you look at, at, at these numbers, I think you can, you can easily imagine, you could hypothesize, you could look at the current uh, proportions of these sorts of animal protein in diet and ask what would happen if the animal protein consumption were the same and you change the ratios. I've done lots of these, and you can see massive decreases in greenhouse gas emissions because of it, uh, big decreases in nitrogen loading and so on that are very possible. Um, and the other thing about the numbers I showed you, which isn't obvious until you just think about them for a second, is this. Everything you feed to some animal that you're growing for its meat that doesn't end up in its flesh ends up as waste. And those wastes then have to be treated, cared for, or, or, or not treated and cared for and end up entering the environment in one way or another. And if you compare things, let's say, to fish, which are the most efficient of all these animal proteins that we've seen, fish aquaculture, uh, if you look at the nitrogen in compared to the nitrogen out, if the nitrogen comes out in protein, everything that does come out as protein comes out as waste nitrogen. So it's 19 to 1 per cow, 19 kilograms of waste nitrogen for every kilogram of N in protein in edible beef, uh, 2 to 1 for fish. So compared to eating a fish diet uh, by growing cattle, there's 850 percent more N coming out as waste. So some of that waste will be fertilizer, can be used wisely. Often fertilizer isn't used very wisely, as we, as we all know. But these are sort of the forces that come out of different diets. So again, you could ask, what about nitrogen and loading into the environment? And what does it depend on? Well, it depends upon what crops you grow. But it also depends on what livestock you grow. And those two together can be vastly different effects, uh, depending upon how efficient uh, the livestock that we eat are. Now. That's one way. So changing diet is one way to change uh, the 
uh, the loading that we have of nitrogen and phosphorus and so on, um, and, and having efficiencies in that direction. There's another well-known efficiency in agriculture, which is, which is not used very much, and that has to do with uh, applying the appropriate amount of a fertilizer at a, the appropriate time uh, during the growing season to a crop. The uh, European Union had, had water quality problems, had problems with high rates of nitrogen loading into uh, the oceans that surround the continent, uh, and in, in the mid-1990s imposed some laws that required farmers to obtain permits to buy fertilizer and to show in their permit application what their yields were, what the level of, of uh, nitrogen was in the soil, and so on. And that uh, led to, over the, over the subsequent years, a, uh, a one-third decrease, so one-third less nitrogen uh, being applied to the fields, uh, this is per hectare, being applied across Europe to the fields. And if you look at what happened to yield, this is uh, crop yield, this is, these are tons of protein produced per hectare, and the same thing is true for kilocalories. The blue colors are the 1960s, 1990s, around the time the policy went into place, right around there, the yellow things. What you can see is yield went up from, from the 1960s on up as more and more N was being used, there's more and more uh, a higher and higher yield of, of the crops, which is what we've seen around the world. Yield is highly dependent upon nitrogen input and phosphorus input and so on. And then what happened when these laws came into being, if you were to plat, plot those same dots, the red dots, which are yields later on in, in the later years, on a timeline, they fall right on the existing timeline. Yields have kept going up as they always have in the past. But now they're going up with less and less end because it's being applied more wisely. And the EU, in a big report that came out about three years ago, showed that, that they didn't look at yields. I've done this. But they looked at the effects on, on water quality measures. And the water quality measures were massively improved. A lot lower rate of loading of nitrogen into the coastal waterways because of this uh, regulation on nitrogen fertilizer uh, in the UK in, in the uh, EU. And so it's very possible to be more efficient. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm so sorry. I cannot walk. Thank you. I see. I can't see. I'm. Hmm. Next time I have to be mic'd up. Sorry about that. Now, many EU nations show this trend. What I think is interesting when I looked at other nations, Mexico shows the same trend. And there was no regulation. This, I've been told by people who work in the Aki Valley of Mexico in agriculture, came about because of some research which showed that Mexican farmers in growing wheat and corn were over fertilizing and the point was made they could actually save money, get the same yield and, and spend less on fertilizer and was adopted by many people on a voluntary basis when they, once they had that knowledge. And they had, they, their curves looked just like that. So that's a, another sort of piece of good news on this. Now, pesticides are a bit trickier and it's not, nothing that I've done a lot of personal work on, but there have been some interesting stories about a different way to reduce pesticide use. And, and this is uh, one that came from China. Uh, there are two varieties of rice that the Chinese eat. One is the sticky variety of rice uh, that has very high gluten content, and one is a more the dry kind of rice that we probably eat more commonly in the US. And the sticky variety of rice has a higher economic value, but it's very susceptible to fungal attack. And as they were growing the rice, they, they, they ended up having to apply fungicides. So people growing the sticky rice almost always had to apply fungicides to the fields which is expensive, as well as having human uh, health impacts. As we know, most fungicides are not the nicest compounds around. And, and someone found that uh, they could decrease the need for fungicide by interplanting rows of the sticky rice, which is susceptible to the fungus, with rows of, of the uh, non-sticky rice, which is uh, resistant to it. And that decreased the chance that an infected a sticky rice plant infected with a fungus would, would spread it uh, to a neighboring plant because the neighboring plants around it on the two sides of it are resistant. And this was then tried and tried on larger and larger scales. It now has taken over vast regions where people, they found after a few years of doing this, they no longer had any fungal problems and they have just quit using the fungicide through large regions of China in growing rice. So it's another way to sort of use some, uh, a biological insight about diseases uh, to have to lower the impact on these. So I guess the big point I want to make is this, and that, that to meet human needs for crop, there's a large amount of land that we farm, and in doing it, we have impacts that, that get carried by our waterways uh, to the oceans. Nitrogen, phosphorus, pesticides, and we have impacts in greenhouse gases. As I said, a third of the greenhouse gases come from, from farming that then affect the atmosphere and also affect uh, the oceans. 
And there's some possible feedback loops here that have already been talked about but that have some really interesting implications. So coastal waterways in the open oceans give us seafood and, and, uh, and other fish and other seafood, uh, which by being a part of our supply might be able to decrease how much of the meat-based seafood that we eat from the land. If doing that, we can actually use that as a way to decrease NP and pesticide loading into coastal waterways. I, w I agree with what Steve said. I don't think we're going to do this sort of light blue arrow, my hope for path of, 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 a, of a partial solution to the problems uh, by wild caught fish, although an interesting paper that came out about a month ago by Steve Costello and Chris Gaines, uh, who are, are an economist and, a, and a, a marine fisheries person, suggests that if they were better managed, uh, the ocean fisheries could give us between 15 and 40 percent more food per year than they do right now, uh, which I think is something that most people don't understand about sustainability. Uh, it's true in the short term for sustainable fisheries, you have to harvest less. But in the long term, you actually can then harvest more because you have the stocks at a point where they're actually growing more quickly. And uh, that, if we could get around the corner and overcome the various problems, and, and Steve mentioned many of these, associated with going toward more sustainable fishery, that's quite a bit, of more, bit more food. But the real solution, I think, is going to come in uh, environmentally wise ways of growing uh, of, of seafood via aquaculture. And there's some interesting work being done now on open ocean cages or far offshore cages, uh, which have shown quite a bit of promise to being growing things at lower densities, less disease problems, and so on. So, but it, it's possible to to use the uh, the coastal waters, the oceans, as a way to help meet uh, uh, demand for food, as well as aquaculture to meet a demand for food in ways that are much more efficient, that have a lot less impact on the environment and a lot less impact back then on the coastal waterways. But in total, these are all linked. We can't look at the oceans and forget the land component. And the land component and the impact of land, to a great extent, comes from our need for food. And I think that, uh, that with that need accelerating as it is, there are some major questions ahead, but I think also some solutions if we look at this whole system. Oh, maybe this I've already told you here. Yeah, I've already told you this, so that's all. Thank you very much.